Thank you, Bert. Uh, bipartisan, uh, 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 confirmed uh, member of the Board of Visitors. Very happy about that. And as a resident of Virginia, it's always a pleasure to be on Mr. Jefferson's campus. Um, thank you for all of those who helped make this evening uh, possible. Uh, Bert mentioned that we formed the Common Sense Society in 2009. That was as the result of having our debating society on the university campus at that time in Budapest um, constrained because we were addressing sacred cows on the university at that time. So it was a sort of early wave of cancel culture. So we formed the Common Sense Society to continue those conversations, that debate, outside the halls of the university. We soon met Roger Scruton, uh, who has since passed. He's a dear friend also of Douglas's, And he had, uh, behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland, supported the underground university seminars and the Samizdat publications. And he recognized some similarity between how the Western hegemonic forces of uh, postmodernism, or whatever we want to call it, were suppressing freedom of academic inquiry and free speech on college campuses. And he recognized the struggle that we had at that time with those dissidents earlier on. So the struggle continues. It's our pleasure to host this conversation. And then we're taking Douglas down to Wofford College in South Carolina, and then to Chapel Hill, uh, UNC, and then on to Richmond. Douglas Murray uh, is heroic in his work. He has tackled the unpopular truth uh, for quite some time. He's an associate editor of The Spectator, and most recently the author of The War on the West and an international bestseller, The Madness of Crowds. Uh, he has recently come back from the war in Ukraine, where he was frontline reporting uh, for the New York Post, and it's our pleasure to have him here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Douglas Murray. Thank you. 
very much uh, to Mary and thank you to Bert. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at the University of Virginia. I must say, it's sort of sometimes you say that when you're at a venue, and you don't really mean it at all. <laughs> um, but I mean it. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've read so much about this institution, and sadly, having, despite having been a native New Yorker for a few years now, still hadn't made it down here. So I'm very pleased to be here and to see this beautiful campus, which has really been a a great honor and pleasure to see. Um, I'd like to thank the Common Sense Society and the Jefferson Council and all of you. Um, I just mentioned I'm, I'm a New Yorker these days. You can probably tell it hasn't yet rubbed off <laughs> accent-wise. It's still clear I'm not from the Bronx, but, the, um, <laughs> but I made New York my home, and uh, it's a wonderful city. I'm about the only person who's very positive about New York these days. Um, but when I first moved to the city, I moved just in time for uh, an extraordinary thing to happen, the New York State Council Chamber. Um, some of you will know this, but uh, the New York State Council voted on the removal a couple of years ago of a statue of Thomas Jefferson, which had been in the Council Chamber since the 1830s. And um, the statue was hauled down off its plinth, was sort of crated up, and wheeled out a back door. Um, and one of the members of the council who'd voted for this was quoted by the New York Post, which I write for, saying, um, well, and this is the exact quote, Thomas Jefferson doesn't represent our values. I thought that was a quite remarkable uh, statement to make. Somewhat presumptuous, you might say. Um, you might also ask the follow-on question, if Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers, don't represent your values, who does? And I suspect that this councilwoman, if she were able to be honest, would have said, well, me, obviously. <laughs> but uh, but she, didn't, she didn't get a chance to answer that question. But I was surprised by this, because this is something... Ooh. I have so many microphones on me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be allowed through a metal detector. And here I am. Um, So the, the, it, down came the statue, and one of the things that occurred to me about this was just so strange, because it, this had all happened in my own lifetime. And if you are older than me, will know this even more so, but in my own lifetime. Now, I grew up in the UK, where um, we don't teach very much about American history, I have to say. <laughs> we really don't. If you think that Americans are ignorant about European history, just wait till you hear <laughs> European on American history. The late um, death of Jessica Mitford um, famously said in one of her books that her own sense of American history from the British schoolroom, such as it was in the mid 20th century when she was being educated, was that the Americans were our friends, had done something bad, and we didn't talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was sort of my own view as well. It was some, some, something you'd done that we just didn't like to talk about. We were family, and it was an embarrassing year, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, um, nevertheless, in my own uh, lifetime, I knew enough about Thomas Jefferson, about the Fanny Fathers, and p people I knew uh, from a bewildering array of political backgrounds, uh, appreciated the men in question, most especially Thomas Jefferson. Um, my late friend Christopher Hitchens wrote a biography of Thomas Jefferson uh, when the state of Iraq was being formed and when the new president was being formed after 2003. Um, Christopher wrote his biography of Jefferson, partly to say this is the sort of figure you need, um, which sadly the country was, was lacking, but um, or didn't have the opportunity to produce, but, but that, that was what people thought about Jefferson only 15, 20 years ago, let's say. So one of the things that's been much on my mind, and which I wrote about in The War on the West, in part, is how, how, did this, how did this conflict come against figures who, in very recent memory, were so revered? And I could give a list of many other figures who've gone through the same process, but Jefferson, I think, is, is maybe the best example of it. Um, but to answer that, I would like to go through a somewhat rabbinical method of addressing the question, which is to ask you a question. 
And the question is this, and I ask it sincerely, and maybe one of the students or others could answer it, because I'm genuinely open for an answer. What is the opposite of a public intellectual? Now, re repeat the phrase. What is the opposite of a public intellectual? Now, you might wonder, first of all, why do we define terms? What's a public intellectual? I, I would give you the following definition. Somebody who puts out ideas in public and defends them in public. I could give you examples of all sorts of people from different backgrounds who disagree. Any of you who've got access to YouTube, and I'm sure all of you do and waste as much of your days on it as I do, um, can look up uh, the debate at the Cambridge Union in 1965 between William F. Buckley and, uh, and his then, amazingly enough, uh, opponent, James Baldwin. Um, both of these men were at their absolute peak. Both were public intellectuals. Both disagreed vociferously. Uh, my own view, Baldwin wiped the floor with Buckley, but Buckley was superb as ever. The point is, is that these, th this was an age where if you put out an opinion in public, you had to defend it. You had to. You couldn't just throw out an opinion and then disappear. Uh, you had to be willing to defend your point of view in public. I submit that one of the deep problems that this society in America in particular is going through at the moment is that the space that used to be taken up by public intellectuals is taken up by this very hard to define group that we need to find a name for. The person, and I will give you three that I have in mind, the person willing to throw out a highly inflammatory set of claims, including ahistorical claims or incorrect claims about history, and then not defend them. Ladies and gentlemen, for my first victim, <laughs> I would like to give the example of a writer called Robin D'Angelo. Some of you may have uh, come across her work. I'm sorry for those of you who've had to read it. I have. Um, let me give some examples of what D'Angelo just does on an ordinary day in one of her books. This is her in 2021 in a book called Nice Racism, the irony of which I'm not sure she got. Um, she, she said at one point this. She said, young people in America today, this is a direct quote, have, uh, who actually have cross-racial friendships tend to have relationships that are conditional their friends of color must tolerate constant racist teasing or be dismissed as angry and not fun and then abandoned. She said, so no, I don't think that this generation is less racist than the older ones. It's a very curious assertion to make. She doesn't defend it anywhere. Goes completely against all the data that we have in attitude surveys and much more. Uh, from the last century in America. But here's another example, because I wanted to give you a couple of examples of how Miss D'Angelo argues. Her most popular book um, from a few years ago uh, was a book um, called White Fragility, which uh, hit the New York Times bestseller list. It's sold by, and I say this with envy as all authors do, by the hundreds of thousands. There's no doubt about her commercial success. There are lots of doubts about what she writes about in her books. And this is what she does on the one time she faces a questioner who has a question that is difficult. Because, she, again, she doesn't submit herself to interview. She thinks that it's, she shouldn't platform any, she thinks that any opposing view to hers is not just wrong but racist. Therefore, she would be giving a platform to a racist were she to debate anyone, which is why she doesn't debate anyone. You can see how convenient this is as well. <laughs> Anyhow, for one of the very few times Miss Janjo has given an interview was actually on Amanpour and Company in 2018. She wasn't actually interviewed by Christian Amanpour, but by Michelle Martin, a woman who happens to be black. Um, and Michelle Martin uh, put one claim of Robin D'Angelo's to her, one claim. Um, where she said, this is what D'Angelo says, she, D'Angelo claims in her book that white people find racism, quote, exciting and enjoy indulging in it. Okay, so her interviewer, she for once has actually put herself in front of an interviewer and is on camera. And the interviewer says, 
Why do you say that, though? You're a scholar. Where's your data? What makes you say that? These are all very good questions. <laughs> and you might be unsurprised to hear that Robin DiAngelo cannot answer these questions. This is what she said in response. Quote, there is a kind of glee in the white collective when black bodies are punished. That, that, that is a, I struggle for words on this, and I don't usually. That, that, that is a quite extraordinary thing to do. You have made one outrageous assertion, and you are held to account once for it in public, and your one response is to come back with an even more outrageous and improvable assertion. America in the 2020s, ladies and gentlemen. i give you a second example before I get closer back to home. Nicole Hannah-Jones and the 1619 Project. You can't uh, move. Again, I don't doubt the commercial success of this enterprise. I think that if the New York Times hadn't have given its imprint to the project, the 1619 Project would have been of no particular consequence. But as everybody knows, it's a major Hulu streaming uh, success. It's, there are children's versions of the book. Most bookshops you go into America, um, you're sort of offered multiple versions of it at different tills, and, and it's sort of one of the things that is presented now in America as one of your five fruit and veg a day that you sort of have to read, one of these books, for your, for your moral and possibly physical improvement. Um, and Nicole Hannah-Jones, again, she and the authors of the 1619 Project actually say that they will not debate the project in question. Now, the project in question as her editor of the New York Times said, seeks to, quote, reframe the founding date of America, uh, to turn the founding date to 1619. When it was pointed out by some people that this was their effort, uh, the response of the editor of the New York Times was to say that we never said we wanted to reframe the founding date of America. Well, he was correct in a sort of barrier-like way, a slightly Stalinistic way, because by that point they had silently edited that quote out of their online copy, so that it didn't say that we seek to reframe the founding date of America. It's quite impressive. Stalin would have loved this. Um, the ability to just say, I didn't say it. I took it out of the record, don't you know? Um, anyhow, um, the uh, authors of the 1619 Project, among other things, as, as any of you who had to read it will know, um, do extraordinary things. Like they decide that they want to do, among other things, a drive-by shooting on capitalism. So if you're going to do a drive-by shooting on capitalism, who do you get to write it but a sociologist of no distinction? And that's what they did. And this sociologist of no distinction writes a chapter of the 1619 Project in which he says, among other things, that everybody who sits down at a desk in modern corporate America and uses a spreadsheet system is, unwittingly or otherwise, engaged in the same practice as went on on the plantations. And his description of why this is is because he says that on plantations there were accurate records kept. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that simply means that all accurate records from ancient Babylon to the present are to do with slavery and plantations. And it's also to completely ignore the fact that the system in question was a feudal system, not a capitalistic system. But never mind. The point is, is that the, all these allegations were put out there. Among other things, capitalism is also racist and so on and so forth. Again, ordinarily, if you make a claim like that, you have to defend it in public. And yet, not only do the authors of this project not defend it in public, they boast that they don't want to defend it in public because they don't respect the sort of people who would oppose them. And whenever prominent historians, and there have been many, of a bewildering array of backgrounds, have said, I'm sorry, your basic facts are wrong on X, Y, and Z, the response usually quite crudely comes from Hannah Jones and others, go, who are you? I don't respect you as a historian. You may have this history of books and uh, uh, chairs in um, politics, but I don't respect you. Um, again, it's sort of clever trick in a way. But I wanted to mention one other case because it comes closer to home to where we are today, uh, which is a case of another person who we need to find a term for, a, no, a non-public intellectual. 
uh, which is Ibram X. Kendi. Like D'Angelo, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, sold by the bucket load. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies. There's a, even a version of it called um, Anti-Racist Baby, which I've also read, <laughs> just about got through it, and is only slightly more mature than the other version. But... Um, Ibrahim makes, Kennedy makes allegation after allegation, which he will not, again, will not debate in public. He will not appear on a stage with anyone who disagrees with him. Um, several efforts have been made by friends of mine to, to try to tease him out of his burrow on this. You just you can't get him to do it. There are quite a lot of reasons for that. One is that, among other things, his definition of racism is a circular definition. If he's asked what racism is, he'll say racism is a system of racist... Uh, uh, ideas embodied in racist principles that lead to racism. I mean, uh, you can't use a thing to define the thing, but he does. In any case, for our purposes tonight, a much bigger problem with what Kendi does is the drive-by shooting he does on Thomas Jefferson, his most famous book. And this is worth mentioning for a moment, because I think it's, it gets to the core of one of the problems that is happening in institutions like this one. Because after all, again, let's assume we're speaking into a vacuum of extraordinary ignorance nationally and internationally. And if anyone wants to argue that one out with me, I'm very happy to. Um, we're, we're speaking into a vast vacuum of ignorance in all of our countries about history. We will probably find in any room in any university in Britain or America uh, maybe half a dozen historical figures we can all have in common that we can recognize. And beyond that, you start to get very lost if you ask for a baddie, you can agree that Hitler. Ask for a second baddie, you know, Hitler's people or something. You, 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 you don't have any name recognition. There are polls on this. There's no name recognition in Britain or America for anyone like Pol Pot, Chairman Mao, anyone like this. So, so there's just horrible lack of historical knowledge everywhere in our societies. And then imagine that a best-selling book called How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is, after all sounds like a good thing to want to be, um, does an assault on a historical figure. Well, that's what Kendi does in his celebrated book. And this is, this is a really interesting and telling episode in this era of the, as I say, unwilling to debate in public, public intellectual. Um, Kendi does an attack on David Hume, which we might get on to. David Hume, the great philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, well known among all Hume scholars, there's one footnote he once had in one of his works, which is an undoubtedly racist thing that he says. It's the only thing in any of his work. All Hume scholars know about it, and all are embarrassed by it, and sort of say it's so strange because it's against everything else he said. Um, Kendi talks only about this footnote, as if he stumbled across it in a reading of the collected works of David Hume. Um, and then he does the same thing to Thomas Jefferson. And this is what he says about Thomas Jefferson. He says, Thomas Jefferson seemed to believe that all men are created equal. But he says Jefferson didn't believe this because he says, quote, Thomas Jefferson never made the anti-racist declaration. Well, first of all, the, the anti-racist declaration is written by Ibram X. Kendi in 2020. <laughs> we cannot hold it against Mr. Jefferson that he didn't expect this particular line. However, he says Thomas Jefferson was at fault because he never made the anti-racist declaration that all racial groups are equals. Um, he says uh, white segregationist ideas suggest a racial group is permanently inferior. Assimilationist ideas suggest a racial group is temporarily inferior. And then he quotes from a letter of Thomas Jefferson's. And this is the one quote he gives from Jefferson. Quote, it would be hazardous to affirm that, equally cultivated for a few generations, the Negro would not become equal uh, to the white man in assimilationist fashion. Um, I thought this was a very interesting quote. I thought it was interesting for several reasons. One is, as some of you may know, that at the time that Thomas Jefferson was alive, there was a, a, an argument that was totally unsettled and wouldn't be settled for, lot, for many decades to come which was the argument that's forgotten about, like all dead arguments, you know, why return to them as it were, but the polygenesis-monogenesis argument. 
it, it, it was going through all of the Enlightenment era, which might be one of the reasons why the Enlightenment thinkers have been so assaulted in recent years. It was essentially that nobody knew whether the, the races, which everybody, everybody by then in, in Europe and America realized existed, whether the races came from the same origins or not. We might think now, of course, this is an absurd thing not to know, but they just didn't know. And it led to lots of very, I mean, historically now interesting disputes. Like the people who thought the, the polygenesis argument had to work out, for instance, did was there like a white Adam and Eve and a black Adam and Eve and a Chinese Adam and Eve? And there really were people trying to work this out. I mean, it seems extraordinary in, in hindsight, but it, everything seems extraordinary in hindsight. Um, but this argument was going on. It was very live in Jefferson's day. So I thought, well, that's very interesting because Jefferson's obviously in this private letter that's quoted is, is obviously sort of fumbling around with this question that nobody would know the answer to for some decades to come. But then I looked at what Kendi's source was, and I thought, and I thought it must be from the, the letters of Thomas Jefferson. No, it, his source that he has the decency for once to quote um, is from a book on race and racism in America. So I think, oh, okay, that's interesting. You didn't go to the primary source. So I go to the primary source, and I find the letter of Thomas Jefferson's from 1785 to the Marquis de Chester Lux. And this is really interesting, because here's what Jefferson actually says in that letter, in the bit that Kendi uses as a way to try to indict Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson says, again, this is a private letter to his friend in France. He says... I, I believe the Indian, which he meant Native American then, I believe the Indian then to be in body and mind equal to the white man. I have supposed the black man in his present state might not be so, but it would be hazardous to affirm that, equally cultivated for a few generations, he would not become so. Now that, for the 1780s, is a remarkable sentiment. In the 1780s, to believe that... Um, you didn't know whether the races were related, but you had noticed that with the same educational um, uh, opportunities and much more, it seemed that this group had got to the same level of education and that there was no reason why this group couldn't as well. It w was extraordinarily forward-looking. Again, one always has to bear in mind, you go back 200, 250 years, and you say something looks forward-looking, you just have to remember, as I say, the kinds of debates that were really going on at the time. And it's so easy to, to look back, and I, I, I don't want to really sort of beat up on Kendi and others, but I think there's something so incredibly dishonest about, first of all, carrying out scholarship of that kind, of that kind of um, lack of robustness, and secondly, deciding to do so for a very specific political purpose. And thirdly, by taking in none of the historical context of the time. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a great Czech uh, writer, Milan Kundera, who said in a book of his Testaments Betrayed, which came out after the fall of the wall, um, he, said, he said, the interesting thing about mankind is he said, he said, mankind walks in a fog, stumbles along the path as he tries to find his way. He says, the interesting thing is, not this, it's that when we look back, we see the path and we see the man, but we don't see the fog. Everything seems so obvious once you've trodden the path and the fog all disappears. But it's this enormous fallacy of history, which all historians should be, should be aware of. Um, it, what uh, Strauss, Famously described as one of the great problems of the moderns, by which he meant everyone after the ancient Greeks, pretty much, was that he said, he said there was always this tendency to think that because you lived after Plato, you were wiser than Plato. Because you lived after Aristotle, you knew more than Aristotle. Now, it's true that Aristotle had knew nothing about DNA. Uh, Watts was unknown to Thomas Jefferson. Sure, it, it's a sort of banal observation in a way, but it also gets to one of the cruxes of what we're going through at the moment. Um, why would we be doing this ahistorical exercise on the past? And that brings me to an issue of motive, which I want to address quickly, which is this. I was recently doing a set of interviews uh, with leading American historians, mainly on American 
uh, heroes who have been sort of maligned in recent years. And for the, the episode on Thomas Jefferson, I had the great historian Jean Yarbrough join me. And it was a great, great hours discussion. You can see it online if you haven't. I really, really learned from her. Um, but one of the things that I found most interesting was, I said, I said well, let's get on to some of the Jefferson stuff that, that is just in the water now. And one of the things we got onto was the Sally Hemings affair. Now, I would submit, and I've looked at some of the American school textbooks on this, but um, I would submit that most American school children now um, are of the taught opinion that uh, Jefferson had sexual relations with Sally Hemings, father to children. Slowly in recent years, this story has been developed, Monticello, to move from uh, rape into a sort of early interracial romance and all sorts of interesting history it comes from the way in which in the last 20 years people have tried to change the history as well. But one of the most interesting things about speaking about all this with Jean Yarbrough was that she was on the presidential commission in the 1990s looking into the DNA evidence about Thomas Jefferson. She said there was absolutely no evidence that the commission was shown that the DNA that is in the Hemings line is from Thomas Jefferson. There is, a DNA, there is a bit of DNA that is from the, the Jefferson family, but it is just as possible, indeed it seems quite likely, that either the brother or the, the slightly errant nephew, who was known to be a wrong as some of you probably know, wasn't the, 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 the father of these children. Um, now, why does that matter? I mean, in a way you could say, look, who knows, we're litigating something that happened centuries ago. It matters only because we're talking actually about one of the founding fathers. And therefore, deciding that they are a rapist, for instance, is a much more serious charge than it ordinarily would be. Interestingly enough, and again, those of you who've seen the interview will know this, Jean Yarbrough said, I think for the first time on camera in that interview, that there was a very interesting amount of political pressure that was felt by members of the commission in the 1990s. What was the political pressure? Um, as all of us who lived through that period will know, there was a certain William Jefferson Clinton, who was known for a certain act at the time, maybe still is, and that whilst all of this was being litigated in the court of public opinion, and indeed the impeachment proceedings of William, F. Jeff, uh, William Jefferson Clinton were going on, here was this posthumous trial of another Jefferson, and that actually finding that uh, Thomas Jefferson you know, might have sexually abused slaves wasn't unhelpful for the argument of Bill Clinton's camp, which was just a mere dalliance with an intern. I put it out there just to reiterate the point that all of this history is always still alive, and it is always being seen through the prism of what we currently need to be the case. And it has been the case in the American past that the Founding Fathers needed to be seen as supremely virtuous, almost um, godlike figures. There have been times in the American past when that might be needed. And there is a time in the American present when exactly the opposite is the case, when everybody in the American past needs to be ransacked through, assaulted, whatever they did. You start off with people from the South in the Civil War, you end up with people from the North you end up getting Abraham Lincoln. I mean, I, I was saying to the class earlier, I was in Portland undercover with Antifa in 2020 when they pulled down the statue of, Tom, of, of Abraham Lincoln there. And I just thought, wow, there's really nobody left. And actually, when I spoke recently to one of um, Theodore Roosevelt's biographers, I said, um, oh, you're, you're the biographer of only the third most wanted man on Mount Rushmore. Um, um, but wh why would it be that a country would want to ransack through all of these figures? And I, I submit it, among other things, it is precisely to make sure that there is nobody in the American past who Americans can feel pride in. It is actually an assault on the nation. Um, I said to Lincoln's biographer when I was interviewing him, I said, why would people come for Abraham Lincoln? Now, that seems like such a dotty idea. You know, why did they come for all the founding fathers and then come for Abraham Lincoln? Why? And he said something very wise. Andy Ferguson said, I think if, if, if you get Abraham Lincoln, you've kind of got the soul of America in a way. Uh, 
I would say the same thing about Thomas Jefferson. Same thing, actually, in my own country of birth with Winston Churchill, who also has a sort of iconoclastic movement, forever attacking statues of him now. And I said to his biographer, Andrew Roberts, why would they come for Winston Churchill? And by the way, it's a bit like the Jefferson thing and the Lincoln thing. They find these, like, quibbles. Like, there was a minor hurt in a Welsh mining village in 1910 that some people on the political left say it's because Winston Churchill as Home Secretary sent in the police. And you want to go, okay, let's say 10 miners were wounded in Wales in 1910. Standing alone against Hitler. Somewhere on the scales. Like, how, might, there be any, might there be any sense of trying to balance these things out? And the answer seems at the moment to be absolutely not. Absolutely not. You do, you, you, if, you, if anyone from the past is found ever to have thought something we do not think in the 2020s, bang, done. We don't need you. Why is that so dangerous? Well, actually, it's uh, a couple of things. But the first thing is this. It, it, it leaves you with no heroes. And left with no heroes, you have no one to guide you. Um, when I was speaking to Roosevelt's biographer, I said to him, what, what attitude should we take to figure like uh, TR? He said, I don't think we need an attitude, he said, but, but he said, history is like, like an attic. You know, you've got all this stuff up there and you sort of forget about it. But you might need it again someday. Um, and there are all sorts of virtues, all sorts of ideals, attitudes, attitudes towards the world that we have now dismissed, and anyone who held these, I mean, David Hume can be dismissed for one footnote, um, because who would need the logic and the wisdom of somebody who helped his age escape from an era of magical thinking and superstition? Why would we ever need to escape from that ever again? Haven't we got that embedded for all time? So the first thing is you're left with no heroes. But the second thing, and this is what is so lethal, someone in the class earlier referred to this about the polarization of American society, the, the most lethal thing is, if you have no agreed-upon past, you can have absolutely no agreed-upon future. Um, and it seemed to me that unifying figures from history can be understood in the round and are fought over traditionally by both political sides. One of the extraordinary things about truly heroic figures is that all political sides end up wanting them and claiming them for themselves. So he was really our guy. Okay, he was with your party, but he was one of us early on, and, 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 and so on. Everybody does that. Um, because if you have an agreed upon past, you have something to move forward with. One of the great problems, it seems to me, in the modern American present is that that past is being just deracinated, and it leaves us only with this present, with the presentism, with the great me that doesn't need any guidance from history, because what did they know? They, they, were, they were people who committed the cardinal three sins of being dead, white, and male. And as anyone of you will know who've heard that phrase used in anger, you'll know that the people who say it seem to use dead as an insult. <laughs> what kind of loser would die? <laughs> On top of everything else, they died? <laughs> Gee, loser. I'm not going to do that. Um, but before we turn over to questions and discussion, um, I just wanted to mention one other thing on this, which is to do with, with the role of free speech in this. Um, I spent quite a lot of my life uh, writing about free speech, and um, a certain amount of my life deciding, you know, the thing about free speech is you, we've sort of known it, as I was saying to students earlier, we've basically known the the basics for two centuries now, and one can repeat them ad nauseum, but the point with free speech is that it's something you do, not just something you talk about. You know? um, if you're gonna do free speech properly, in a pluralistic society, there are only two options. Um, Fleming Rose, my Danish friend, wrote about this in his book a couple of years ago uh, on free speech. There are two options in a highly pluralistic society. In a non-pluralistic society, there's all sorts of things you can do to make sure that speech is unvaried. And that's been the case in all, all societies in the past. 
But in highly pluralistic societies, you basically only have two options. Uh, the first is to clamp down on free speech, which is to decide that somebody must be appointed, an oversight board perhaps, um, a group of wise, anonymous, 20-year-old virgins in Silicon Valley <laughs> will decide what all of us can think, know, and say for the rest of time. Okay, it's possible when you go that route. Uh, if you go that route, you better make sure they never make any mistakes. You better make sure that they're right all the time on everything so that, say, when a global pandemic breaks out, they immediately have their line and they're right from the beginning. And they know everything about ivermectin and masks and the veracity of this and lockdowns and whether they work. And the, you better, they better know about that and everything else in the world. Like they better know from the beginning how the Ukraine conflict is going to end, how Vladimir Putin is going to act. They better know everything. So good luck to those kids. Or, and this is the second option, and you might guess my preferred one, in an era of incredible pluralism, you have to accept more pluralism in speech. You simply have to accept that there will be a lot of different attitudes and opinions in your society. And that, by the way, to my own mind, is the most desirable situation imaginable. As I've often said to those who wish to impose new blasphemy laws on societies, it's only if you've been through such a process that you realize that the only society worth living in is one in which even your deepest feelings can be trodden upon. There is no other society more worth living in than that. But for some people, that this is difficult, and we have to accept it's difficult for them. Well, fine. We can't go at the speed of the slowest kid in the class. The one thing I would beg people to do is to remember that free speech includes the necessity of defending your opinions in public, which is why, before I hand over to you, I beg you to help me find a word for the people who simply throw out things that very often turn out to be lies and then say it's beneath their dignity to discuss their mistake. Thank you. Right, so we'll continue this exercise in free speech. If you have a question or a comment, uh, agreeable or disagreeable, if you would uh, raise your hand and I will call on you and we'll have a mic to you. Um, I don't see any hands yet, so please, please get ready. Today. But I will, uh, I'll ask you one thing. So I like to say that um, there are only two ways to get anyone to do anything, and that's either uh, persuasion or coercion. Mm. And it seems in our society, especially on college campuses and in tech companies and the media, that we more and more rely on coercion. Cancel culture, obviously a form of coercion. If you have the wrong view, you express it. You, you might lose your place at university or a job prospect or something like this. Um, is this going to burn out? Or where does this end, do you think? Well, I can answer that question, but first of all, I must confess my privilege. <laughs> I, 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 this is the one thing on which I will confess my privilege. I have an enormous privilege in my life, which is that I can say what I like, um, and um, I have no one who can stop me. Um, and that is a privilege, actually. And it's not one that very many people in our society have. I do owe a sort of, yeah, I'm going to have to have this being recorded. Any of my editors are listening. But anyway, I sort of owe something to my editors. If my editor didn't like something I said, I probably wouldn't be able to get that passed, although I might push and get it in in the end. But my point is simply that there are relatively few people in the position that I've just described. Most people have some kind of need to go along with whatever the main stream opinion is in their orbit at the time. And that includes, and this is one of the great mysteries of this in our age, that includes things that are actually very minority opinions that are made to 
feel as if they are the mainstream. Now, how does that work? Um, the, the way I best think of it is there's two analogies from nature that I can give which explain what I think is the dynamic of our time. The first is, any of you who have ever observed this, I owe this to a biologist friend, um, this observation. Um, the first is what happens if a zebra gets a mark on it that distinguishes it from the rest of the herd. If you, um, if you go and paint, if you were to go to the savannah and put a red, say, paint mark on the back of a zebra, it'd be dead by the end of the day because it's distinguished from the rest of the herd and the predators who previously only see the herd, see a specific animal dead. The second analogy I would give is also from, um, uh, from nature. And uh, is one of my favorite things as a boy was watching uh, sheepdogs. Mm. I mentioned this the other day to a friend in America who said, isn't that all that's shown on British television? <laughs> <laughs> this is outrageous. We've, we've, we've come up with many other Agatha things Christie apart least, from yeah. sheepdog trials <laughs> on television <laughs> in the UK. But the point is, is that um, those of you who've ever seen a, a sheepdog um, maneuvering a herd will know that if you want to get a herd of sheep through a gate, uh, the dog does not run straight at the center of the herd. It, 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 it runs to the edges of the flock and it nips to correct the nature of the whole of the rest of the herd. I think that's what's happening in our day. And sometimes it's more than a little nip. Sometimes it's an absolute savaging. Yeah. Look at what was tried against my compatriot J.K. Rowling, yeah. um, a woman who doesn't give in easily, has no reason to give in, but pretty publicly savaged and yeah. uh, horribly lied about and defamed in the most grotesque ways. Why? Actually, not because of her, but to make sure that nobody else did that. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer, of course, and this is where the deviation from the sheep and the sheepdog comes along, is that people need to say, no, 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 you don't get to control me. I won't be herded, I won't be nipped, I won't be bullied, I won't be uh, told to lie, I won't be told to go along with the rest of the herd if I don't want to. Well, that's what we need. Mm. Yeah. If, if I could ask you to identify yourself and then uh, make your statement or pose your question, please. My name is Betsy Dickel. I have two children, graduated from this institution, my husband and I also. I wanted to say three things. The first is that we have wonderful sheep dog in Virginia. So <laughs> <laughs> enjoy us. Um, Literally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Vicious commits for your name of your people because I think that is a term that will soon be available because it will be excised from Charlie and Chop. Those are the people outer space beings that are attacking your very last subject. My last actual question to you is how do you deal with nice people who are going along with this? That is problem that women of my generation face is that we in church and school and in the coffee house um, are confronted by people who really have a very uh, surface understanding of a lot of these issues. Mm. Can't or are not willing to believe what you're trying to, to share with them. And it, it basically will destroy some of the social fabric that you can push. Mm. I just wonder if it, I mean, I don't know, but I was wondering if you have learned anything about how to deal with people who have good intentions, but just don't seem to have any interest in looking at their ways or um, I, th I think that it's a very good question. I think there are several things. One is, some people present at least might have had the example in recent years of being told to read a certain book. In fact, the, the three writers I mentioned earlier, almost all of them are on these sort of lists of books. I mean, I know people, for instance, whose church group has told them these are the books you have to read. My answer to that is that you should always say, I'd be very interested in reading the books you recommend here are three books I'd like you to read, and then let's talk. Mm 
And if the answer comes back, I'm not reading your books, you say, oh, I see, well, this isn't really an exchange at all, is it? This is like a lecture, this is a sermon. You want me just to agree with you, otherwise it's all off. I mean, where does that stand in friendship terms or respect terms? Mm. Does anyone have a friend here who they respect, who respects them, who would put up with that tone of voice uh, to be told, I know what's best for you and you better get your reading list in order. Mm. Chum. <laughs> who would want to be talked at in those mm. terms by friends or peer groups? Mm. You have to be able to say, okay, if we're approaching this, we approach it as equals. So I will read what you would like me to read and I'd like you to read something that gives you s some other points of view. And I think that is the absolute bare minimum. You see, in a way, the question comes back to the question of equality. Are we talking about this as equals? Uh, if we're not, then you should say so at the outset, that you think you're my superior, mm -hmm. that you're morally better, and that I'm some kind of great unwashed, ill-lettered maniac who doesn't know how to read, probably, and mm -hmm. can't write, and except in some situations where, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think people have to recognize this about respect. And one of the things about respect is that if you actually respect people, it includes telling that you think that they're wrong. And that goes both ways. Um, and I mean, there are all sorts of arguments you can simply make to ask people just to puncture their opinions uh, on, and presumptions on certain things. I mean, you know, on the history one, it's, it's definitely worth asking people who think that the entire past should be condemned by asking very basic questions like, the following one is quite useful, I find, is to say, okay, even very brilliant men and women from the past had ideas that we think are crazy now, and did things we think now are wicked. How about, instead of castigating them for things a quarter of a millennia ago, we assume that since we're also human beings, we're doing things in our own time, which our successors will look at and think, what were they thinking? Why don't we try to work out what those things are now and stop doing them faster? <laughs> Would that be a better use of our time? And let me give one very quick example of such a thing. I mentioned this in the War on the West. There are estimated to be, I think, 30 million slaves in the world today. Mm -hmm. I've, I've met people on my travels in Africa born into slavery. It's, 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 you have to pinch yourself that this is the case, that this goes on. What, what in that argument, what, what is a better use of our time and our exertions? It's not limitless. You can admit to the wickedness of slavery in the American past and in the past of almost every country and civilization on earth. And you could decide to spend all of your time beating up on people who died 200, 250 years ago. Or you could try to address the 30 million people living in slavery today. What's a better use of your and my time? Here, here. Here, here. Other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Chris had in full disclosure, I'm clandestinely here as a conservative politician, serving the world since in Virginia. Your cover's blown. A couple of things that, that occurred to me uh, as you're going along. You, you talked about sharing books, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, observation, I would just say that the concern I have is that people don't actually read. The people who hold me in a position know about the ideas, but they never actually read the books. <coughs> but as you actually read the books, you begin to see, I think, some of the, uh, the fallacies in say because it really becomes, it becomes very challenging to read something and digest it, but it's a lot easier to be given talking points. Mm. Yeah, and I'm wondering how we can that, that 
because that's I believe you, I can accept that. Mm-hmm. And and it humbles significant amount. But I, I also question I know in my own life the answer to this for me is a conservative, but you you mentioned the analogy of the sheepdog mm-hmm. running around and living and sometimes they're very sad and say, I'm not to see that, I experienced that. Um, and, and you combat that as best you can, depending on where you are in the area. But when you're dealing with that analogy, behind the sheepdog is the shepherd. Mm. And my question is, I know in my life, my shepherd is Jesus. So that's the one I'm going to be looking to as the one that will guide the decisions that I'm going to make. Who is the shepherd? Mm. Mm. That's a very good question. Sensorious shepherd, yeah. Um, well, um, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question, not an easy one to answer. One point I would make is this, and it actually comes slightly off from your reference to your own um, beliefs. Um, there is a mistaken uh, idea going around still that we live in a highly secular age, and we don't. We live in a very, very religious age. It's just that religion has shifted. And um, if you look, my, my, I have a friend called Tom Holland, not Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> he hates that so much. <laughs> He's a historian of the ancient world and wrote a very good book on ancient uh, Persia and uh, another thing. But a history of, the, of Christianity a little while ago called Dominion, a very, very fine book. And this is one of the bases of Tom's argument. He, he says modern mankind doesn't realize how Christian they are, that they've lost the, the substrate of it, but they don't realize. I mean, for instance, and I wrote, I wrote about this a few books back, but like um, the culture of human rights that people talk about so easily now in the West. People say they're inviolable. They're, they're, they're entirely ignores the fact they're violated all over the world all the time. They're clearly not inviolable. They're forever being violated. What is the system of human rights? It's an attempt to um, put into legal framework a Christian understanding of the sanctity of the individual. And um, the heresies that we have in our time are all sorts of derivations of Christian heresies. Again, I mean, I mentioned this to some students earlier, but many of the places around the world I've gone, people wouldn't care if you said that they were racist because they don't care about that or think it's a problem. We do in a country like America. Why? Because we have, among other things, a Christian understanding of the sanctity of the individual and the equality of all people in the eyes of God. How do you turn equality in the eyes of God into a secular version? We're trying to work it out. Um, we're not very good at it. It's a very, ham- it's a very ham-fisted theology, but if you look at much of the, the work that I've critiqued in recent years in this book and also in The Madness of Crowds, what you're really dealing with is a sort of Christian heresy. Um, <coughs> which believes, among other things, in an eschatology Mm. in which justice comes on earth Mm -hmm. if you get the formula right. And the formula is very complex, but if you do the work and lots of other stuff, you can get the justice on earth now. I think it's a utopian fantasy. And um, I think it already is. It's like the thing of problematizing, you know. Mm. Everyone talks about problematizing. How about solving a problem? <laughs> we have time for a few more questions. Maybe a student, yes, sir, in the blue jacket. I thought you were going to say the gentleman with the white hair. When you said student. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Gonzo, and I'm Hi. a student of the Portland Military Academy. And um, I wanted to ask a question. You speak out against, you know, regular speech and how, you know, we can't regulate ourselves to follow one straight line of thought, but would you say that there are instances where regulating certain speeches is necessary? If you don't mind bringing up an example, I would say uh, Kanye West, for example, saying mm-hmm. some of the stuff along the lines of, 
Quite literally, I like Hitler. Is mm. not something that should be an individual opinion in this mm. day and age, or at least I would argue that that's not something that should be said in a public setting. Mm. That kind of brought up, and I don't want to come across like that. Or mm. what kind of speeches would you say would fall under a category of should be regulated or should not be regulated? It's a very good question. When, when I was about your age, I, uh, I was at Oxford, and I remember very distinctly, it's one of those things where, um, and I think everyone who's sort of slightly older should always remember this, that everyone has been through this argument in every generation. And we all went through it at some point as students. When I was an undergraduate, uh, there, was, there was, is, a famous Holocaust denier called David Irving, and he was invited to the Oxford Union to speak and uh, in a debate. And uh, I remember you know, we were all outraged. And I remember arguing with people, usually in the pub, uh, as if that made a big difference. Um, uh, I won last night. Uh, um, but I remember arguing vociferously with some of my contemporaries that he shouldn't have the right to speak at the Oxford Union. And now I think I was probably wrong, almost certainly wrong. And that what I think is that you have to um, just make sure that somebody like that is countered by somebody. I mean, when David Irving then sued, was sued, actually, he lost the case rather well, famously in the late 90s because uh, historians who knew a lot more were put on the stand and it was made clear that his scholarship was a case of fabrication and eliding quotes and avoiding things. It's a very, very interesting lesson. In, now, funnily enough, when we were talking earlier with some students about John Stuart Mill, this completely vindicated one of Mill's arguments, which is that you have to allow the erroneous opinion to be voiced, at the very least, because if you hear it voiced and you disagree with it, you will make your own argument better. Funnily enough, having this, having this cretinous figure, this cretinous figure, David Irving, making these claims, you know, Hitler and you didn't know it about the Holocaust, it wasn't his fault, sort of thing ended up in the 90s making a lot of people have to learn a lot more. And by the way, I think that's the case with somebody like Kanye West. Um, I think he's um, sort of having a breakdown in public as far as I can see. And it's hard to work out with him what's trolling. I think I spoke to a friend of his sometimes. He said oh, he's sort of trolling people and it's some mad experiment in, I, I don't know but I'm not really willing to try to read into his thoughts. And one of the dangers in free speech is always to presume that you know the thoughts of the person in question. But I don't regard, I mean, I regard what he said as being absolutely loathsome, among the worst things that anyone in American public life has said for many decades, actually. Um, I don't think anyone you can select who said sort of borderline anti-Semitic stuff, for instance, in any political party has said anything as bad as what Kanye West said. All of which being said, I don't see what he said as being an actual threat to anyone, because I don't think that he is unanswerable. Now, he has huge platforms, much of which it will eke away, and there will be some pe young people in particular who will you know, be impressed by this star saying these terrible things. But I don't regard it as being any kind of threat, because I think, to put it at its boldest, between somebody who says he likes Hitler and my opinion, I think I'm going to win. <laughs> I think the facts are on my side, or as Norm MacDonald once beautifully said, I think, to Letterman, the more I learn about this Hitler guy, the less I care for him. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, the point is, I, I don't think I had a friend who was a very distinguished publisher in the UK, died some years ago, a Jewish emigre from, uh, from uh, Vienna in 38. In fact, he was one of the last Jews to get out, really. And he, as a publisher, always published books by Nazis. And, you know, published Speer's memoirs, for instance, Albert Speer's mm. memoirs. And my friend's view was always the same. He said, people need to know everything about these people. They need to know everything. And so I, I think one can deplore somebody saying something, but not believe that the answer is to reach for the um, mute button or in any way prosecute them or anything else. It could be different at a different time in history. It could be something you always have to keep your eye out for. <laughs>
All right, time for one last question. A very yes, good sir. Question, Hi. Well, I'm sorry. Hi. Well, I'm actually got one question from the UBS student. I'm going to see you yeah. in the chair here. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to turn it back to the lady in the front. I think you'll be the first question. <coughs> On how to speak as equals to other peers or individuals. As a third year, I'll be entering the job market in the next two years. I'm going to create this concern on my mind. I'm going to balance this principle, which is not like a rat. And what's the truth with my career and future mm -hmm. opportunities? I'm looking to see if you have any guidance or insight on the role of the youth, on how we can combat those that project ideologies that aren't actual or proposed claims that have an understanding, mm -hmm. and do so in a way that doesn't limit our abilities. You know, that, that is a very pertinent <laughs> question, which is, I'm so glad you raised it. It's very, very important. Um, because as I said at the beginning, I have a certain privilege in saying what I think, and it, you know, not everyone has that privilege, and particularly not at the beginning of your career. You know, you, you don't want to have unnecessary strikes against you, you know. Sometimes when students say to me, you know, um, I, I want to go into this line of work, I don't know if I should do this or say this, I, I tend to say, look, I, I, I don't think, in fact, I say this in general in society, I don't, I don't advocate kind of people going out and being martyrs for a cause because, you know, um, what I want in general, in particular in modern America, is everyone to take one little step forward. Um, I think that if everyone did a bit of pushing back, a bit more of the pushing back, we'd be in a much better position. And it would be strategically much better than just seeing people you know, unnecessarily you know, die on the enemy lines. Um, but the one piece of advice I can give really is this, is that um, inevitably all of us in our careers, in our lives, certainly when we're starting off, uh, you, you, you can hedge around on certain things. Um, some necessary niceties of, um, I mean, you might, for instance, find that you'll say to a colleague, that's a really good point, and you think, how did anyone say that? It's so <laughs> obvious. You'll find yourself writing thank you for your email to people who you're really irritated they emailed you. <laughs> um, and it's particularly people who do the round robin ones, CCing everyone they know. You know. I'll say, thank you so much for your email. Um, the point is, we're all used to a certain amount of, of this. Now, here's, here's, here's a place where you can't go. Never, ever um, go to the place where you end up having to say stuff that you know not to be true and which demoralizes you. The most terrible type of person in American society today and Western society as a whole, I think, is the demoralized individual mm. who can be from any background, by the way. Um, and if I may, this is an important point Please to finish up with. Um, there's, a, there's a great essay by Václav Havel, uh, the late great Czech playwright, author, and eventually first president of independent Czechoslovakia. Havel wrote a great essay in the 60s called Power and the Powerless. And he, and he says something I think is highly pertinent to our own era. Uh, the essay is about a grocer, a greengrocer, in the corner shop in Prague, who has in his window a, a, a sign that is sent by party headquarters. And it will say something like, um, the workers are the masses, or the, the workers are the fruit of the labor of the, the state, or the, some banal slogan, slogan of the uh, communist apparatniks. And um, Havel says, why? Why once a year or so do party headquarters send these banal signs to people like the grocer and they put it up in the window? And his conclusion is, and it's an extraordinary insight, Harville says, nobody is persuaded by it. 
Nobody walks by and goes, wow, that's an amazing thought. Wow, I hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> I'm so glad I read that window. <laughs> no, it's there, Pavel says, because it shows that the grocer is a subject of the state, is a servant of the state, will do what the state tells him to do. He is not an individual. He is not an autonomous being. The state can even make him go through this little degradation. But every time he looks himself at the poster, he will hate both the state a little bit more and himself because he's been made to go through this little act of subjugation. The crucial thing when you're starting off in your life is not to get that feeling of subjugation, to know that to be an American in this century, at this age, of any background, is to have won the lottery, not just of the geography at the moment, but of history. And the top percentile of people anywhere at any time in the world, with opportunities that none of your ancestors or mine could have dreamt of. And it's all before you. And what you can do in an era where we're this connected, I mean, think of it, if we actually applied ourselves to things worth solving, what we could solve. Mm. You're at the beginning of all of that. So you need to get the clutter out of your way and do what you should be doing with your life, you and all of your contemporaries. Don't waste your time. And don't let them get to you or bring you down. Don't be anyone's servant. What a great point. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this concludes this evening, but I would be remiss if I didn't let this audience know that on April 4th, we will have Glenn Lowry speaking to the Jefferson Council at our dinner and one night all. And then on April 25th, we have George Will coming uh, to talk. We have not figured out exactly where we're going to put George, but we're going to amend it. But those will be the speakers who will have the remainder of this semester. Nobody can be Douglas, but that's the follow up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.